that are available again. We have Marilyn Miller's um, Sons of Darkness, Sons of Light. It's $15. It tells the story of the Reeves family murders in the Grove community. And then we also have the Minden Cemetery book. We were able to reprint it, and it is $40. And then we also still have some of our uh, apron cookbooks, if anybody's interested in those. Um, our scheduled speakers for the year, on April 10th, Randy Grigsby will be speaking. On May 8th um, will be me. I'll kind of give an introduction, who I am. I know there's a lot of people that probably kind of wonder who I am and how in the world I wound up here. Um, on October 9th, uh, Mark Shireen and Jake Chapman will talk about men in high school football. And then save the date for our fundraiser. It's scheduled for September the 11th. We'll be having a cake auction again. There will be a drawing for a gift basket, and you can come dressed as your favorite TV or um, movie character. So you might want to start planning for that. And then we ask that you silence your phones as we welcome our speaker, um, Catherine Poole from the Germantown Colony Museum. Thank all of you for coming tonight. I, uh, I'm going to do a little bit of talking, but probably not a whole lot, unfortunately. I have a uh, senior in high school, and he brought me home the flu uh, two weeks ago. I don't know if but I've just, I think out of the museum, I inhaled probably a half a cup of pollen Saturday, and I'm about losing my voice. I've tried everything in flu, and it's my favorite time of year, but it doesn't like me. I found in my paperwork, and we do miss her so, is our beloved Miss Susie Lester, and I found something that she had typed up, and I thought I would just read that and let Mr. John Sanders um, kind of go on from there. Uh, he's the president of the governing board for the Friends of Germantown. I'll just try to do a little talk that I can before y'all lose me. And she gave me all of this information and stuff and when she stepped down from her position and uh, I thought it would be something in great memories of her and uh, she's got her little name typed at the end of it. This is what she used for her speeches. I'll try to wing it next time on my own. This is the Germantown History written by Miss Susie Lester. So Germantown Colony is one of three sites founded by the Utopian Movement or Harmonist Society in the early days of the 19th century. Colonists came from Germany, founding Harmony, Indiana in 1814 in Economy, Pennsylvania. In 1826 and in Germantown Colony in 1835. The Germantown Colony group was led by Maximilian Bernard Ludwig, alias Mueller, who also called himself Count Leon. Ludwig was born March 21st, 1788. He was in trouble with authorities in Germany because of his religious beliefs. He considered himself a great prophet and believed the second coming of Christ was near. Leon told his property but sold his property in Germany. Um, I still can't read with glasses, can I? Um, chartered the boat Isabella and set sail for America with his family and others who were carefully chosen for their skills and loyalty and devotion. Now these people were from this, out of what she wrote, they, I have people ask me where were they from. They were from Costaheen, Mates, Frankfurt, they were from everywhere. They weren't from just one town, uh, specifically in Germany. This is some new books that we've had stored out there. I wish I could tell you just, if you, to see them in person would be to appreciate them. There is a, a general science book dated for the year 1816. I mean, it's, I know a lot's changed since then. And if I could read German, it would be amazing to read through the book and see what all's been changed. Okay. It says, uh, after he sold his property, they chartered the boat Isabella. 
They landed in New York in 1831 and proceeded to Pennsylvania to join the group there led by George Rapp. They broke off from Rapp and went to Phillipsburg, Pennsylvania to establish the new Philadelphia congregation on March 21st, 1832. Impelled by the idea that his new Jerusalem ought to be established in the uh, same geological uh, latitude as Jerusalem in Palestine, the prophet deter uh, determined that he, with all of his followers who were believers, must gain, uh, again, take up this journey. They left Phillipsburg on September 1st, 1813, and proceeded down the Ohio River, and they traveled down the Mississippi River and up the Red River. They stopped at Grandy Cor on the Red River, arriving there February 4th, 1834. It is there that floods and yellow fever took a toll on the group. Many colonists and possessions were lost. The Count Leon, he died there from yellow fever, and the Countess Alyssa led the group further up north, up the river, and into Dorchet Bayou. The great raft had been removed, and a point above Loggy Bayou, so the travelers proceeded through Georgie Bayou to Overton near Minden. And traveling north, the colonists came to Claiborne Parish, where the tall red hills and deep green forest invited them to stop and rest. They had lost many of their possessions before arriving in Claiborne Parish. They purchased land in what was then Claiborne Parish, now Webster Parish and carved a settlement from the land and towering trees. The colonists built many buildings for their very need. It included a school and a general store. They grew crops, the animals, and most of their needs were made themselves, including weaving and sewing fabrics. It has been said that they brought with them silkworms and planted mulberry trees to feed the silkworms that produced silk thread for them. They believed the second coming of Christ was near, and this was to be the new Jerusalem. Colonists had to accept strict, uh, strict articles of the renewed Christian church for their spiritual and bodily welfare. Everyone had to work taking care of the daily chores and farming. Dr. George Gunchkin, or Genshin, um, I've heard so many names pronounced different ways, so... Um, Everyone, um, he was the spiritual leader in the colony of the colony and upon the death of Count Leon. And it read in his history through the other uh, books and information that I've read, he was actually Count Leon's secretary. And so uh, I guess you consider him uh, would be the head deacon because it was a Christian movement. Well, the Civil War came many problems. There were hard times for all inside and outside of the colony. People were not able to pay for, pay, uh, for items themselves purchased at the general store. This once thriving community now had financial troubles. Some of the colonists moved to other areas. The Countess moved to Arkansas to be near a daughter. <laughs> the colony disbanded in 1871 and the Krause family were the ones remaining and took care of the older colonists until their death. Dr. F.O. Krause, probably the pharmacist, was married to Rosora Ginchin, who was the daughter of George and Magdalena Ginchin. Magdalena, a sister of Countess Alyssa. Chester and Ruby Krause, who were the grandchildren of F.O. Krause, along with Chester's wife, Florence, donated the Germantown Colony property to the Webster Parish Police Jury in 19, 1973. Many of the descendants of the colonists reside in the Minden area in North Louisiana. The original buildings 
that remain at Germantown Museum are the Keltis' Cottage, which is one of the ones that you'll see on this display. That's the well right outside of the Countess's cabin. And that's Donna Dennett Sanders. We have so much fun with the children when they come. Uh, replicas of the smokehouse and the blacksmith shop are <coughs> stand where the original buildings were. The kitchen is also the original dining hall. It's in the original location as the Countess's house. A building in place of the bachelor's house was donated and moved to the grounds, but it was uh, it fell down during a bad storm. But this this was written October the eighth, two thousand, by Miss Susie Lester, and I just thought we we lost her recently. I know a lot of you knew her, and I I loved her very much. She came out and talked to me a lot. Uh, and worked in the flower beds, and it just meant so much to her. I wish she was still here to see it grow, um, and the things that we've got planned and coming for the museum. Um, I'm probably not going to rattle on a whole lot more. I don't normally sound this way, I promise y'all. Um, my voice is just about gone, and I've got a group coming that's after tomorrow. So I'm going to try to let it rest a little bit, but I'm going to uh, introduce Mr. John Sanders. But before, we are having a bluegrass festival. The museum had not had a blue, hasn't had a bluegrass festival in 10 years until last year. And it turned out wonderful and such a great success that we're having another one this year. It's going to be April the 15th on a Saturday. We'll have a trolley that will bring people. It's going to be held at the Webster Parish Fairgrounds. Um, just be sure, uh, bring the family and grab a lawn chair, limited seating on hard bleachers. Um, there will be a food vendor and people set up uh, with, uh, with booths selling goods and things. But uh, there will be a trolley to bring visitors to the museum and back to the festival that's included with your little entry ticket. And we're, we're doing something different. Um, this year we're actually going to have a, a prize gift for a drawing. Um, I know all of the things that's going to be in this basket, and it's it's going to be one amazing basket. And you're not you're not going to want to miss out. I'm actually a little jealous that I can't bid on it. <laughs> anyway, here's John Sanders. Well, I'm going to run over some of the things. A few things to repeat, but. I believe the uh, Germantown Colony is a treasure. I really do. And that's why Janet and I volunteer. Of course, it's a lot of fun with kids. And we've been all in. I know that people more travel than I am. But if you can find a 180-year-old cabin in the United States, which is rare, they probably won't let you go in it. And I, I begin, I, I find this it's an incredible story of Americana looking for religious freedom, uh, struggle, the frontier, it's all here in these people. And I, a lot of times I try to tie it in with people that were overlapped in time with Davy Crockett and Daniel Boone and Kit Carson, which were a big part of our history when I was growing up. Guess what? Kids don't know any of those names today. No. And the first of these groups to come over, but well, first of all, I try to put them people in a period of time. How many of you realize that they were here before the Alamo? That was a long time ago. And the frontier aspect of this part of the state, when they came, there was only one road in northwest Louisiana. That was the old military road. Came within a quarter mile of Germantown, down through Minden, down to Fort Jessup. <coughs> in that condition, went up to Camden and on up to Fort Smith. But the Merle Pilgrims, which came, were the first people here, they said it didn't bring in settlers. There were just a handful of people here. The settlers really didn't begin to arrive until they built the East-West Road. So these people are very much in the wilderness. The year they came, they opened a trading post on Door Cheek. It was opened by another German, the German that founded Minden, Veter, wasn't associated with the colony. That's one store, one road. You know, you have to think about. 
And then to back up, they had this arduous journey down the Mississippi, down the Ohio, started on rafts, then got flat boats, mosquitoes, uh, boats overturned. The journey was so difficult that when the older folks were asked to recount it later on, they said, no, we don't want to think about it, it was too hard. <laughs> That's how hard it was. So you go back now, I'm kind of backing up, but it's important to me for everyone to know what they believed and why they came. To understand these people, you have to read about George Rapp. George Rapp, as she mentioned, run some of these other colonies. He came over the same year as the Lewis and Clark expedition. So he was here 25 years before these folks came. They were Protestants. They were in rebellion against the Lutheran church. They said the church had again become corrupted, that the leaders of the state were the leaders of the church and they weren't believers. So George Rapp, there's volumes of material that he wrote. He tells you, he tells you exactly what he believed and why he believed it. To understand these people, you have to understand him because they copied him. They wanted to imitate everything he had done. They wanted to go into the wilderness. Uh, they wanted to live the communal lifestyle. And that's a lot of, uh, something a lot of people don't understand. They, they believe that, as she said before, that the coming of Christ was a few years or at most a few decades away. And they look forward to the millennial reign, the thousand year reign of Christ. So they, their interpretation of the scriptures was that they had a special dispensation to live communally, not like the Bolshevik revolution of communists, but according to their interpretation of the second and fourth chapter of the book of Acts, where everything was brought into a common storehouse. And they believed that when Christ returned, he would set up government as it's described in the book of Acts, because they were already living this way, according to this special dispensation, they would be the church of Philadelphia, the, the very true church. And I lost my train of thought, but so much of this I just find so interesting. They, they were persecuted in Germany for their faith. There was not a small movement George Rapp, at the time he left, they estimated that the number of people in rebellion was about 12,000. So this is a little known group. The other thing that, um, if you read a lot of articles, they talk about the mysticism. Once you really read what they believe, the mysticism is way overplayed. Like, Char Bernard Mueller, who, who was not a count. He got aboard the ship in 1831, announced that he would be called count. See, I mean, you're coming to America, <laughs> might as well. <laughs> but he was a man that uh, had been a flim flam man. He had been in trouble. There's some evidence that uh, he was raised a Catholic, but it's not clear. And when you look him up on the internet, it says a man of uncertain origins. But at some point, he is converted. I give him credit for being legitimately converted. You may not. But his wife, who seems to be a woman of Proverbs, the Elisa, she always held him in high esteem. And so these folks, they held George Washington in high esteem. They um, thought a lot of the Masonic Lodge. That was big in their thinking. And when they got ready to leave Germany because they said it was intolerable, they wrote a letter to President Jackson. And President Jackson wrote them a letter back, a handwritten letter. And I, I think that's wonderful because they want to know if we come to America, can we live as we interpret the scriptures? 
And he says, yes. Will we, will we be treated in it differently according to the law of the land? He says, no. And I actually, I would like, and I'm almost finished, I'd like for somebody to volunteer to read Jackson's letter. Who's, who, who would like to do that? Good reader. Just point to somebody. Robert. Huh, Robert? This is a handwritten letter. It is either written directly by Jackson, or he wrote that, or he had somebody to write it longhand, and then he signed it. It's hard to read. There's actually two pages of it, but we got it condensed here so you can read it. Okay. What he said. Not many people have a letter from a president. Okay, um, handwritten letter from President Jackson to Count de Leon, Washington, D.C., September the 14th, 1831. Sir, it gives me pleasure to acknowledge the receipt of your letter of the 7th instant and thank you for the polite and favorable terms in which you are pleased to speak of me. On the subject of your letter, I have conversed with Mr. Kai, K-A-H, I, who will be able to confirm to you the satisfaction with which I heard of your determination to take up your abode in the United States and identify with this soil and climate your resources. Such acquisition it is the interest and pride of the United States to cherish. And as their highest executive officer, I take delight in assuring that the benign and equal spirit of their laws will not only protect your person and property, but I trust will promise to you the enjoyment of as much prosperity and happiness as can be promoted by the influence of government in any country elsewhere. I am very respectful, your obedient servant, Andrew Jackson. And that's his signature. Yeah. So the, and, and I, I didn't know this, the librarian explained it, but it says the seventh instant, that was a way of saying this month at, at that time. I, and, uh, you know, he doesn't sign it, His Excellency or Mr. President, he signs it, he closes it with your obedient servant, mm -hmm. and just writes his name. So that's very cool. If y'all want to pass that. And did I leave out anything important? No. Any any questions about the colony? I, I would invite all of you to be a member of the Friends. Uh, we have some great need on rehab and repair of the buildings. It's, it takes constant repair to keep them up, and uh, so we need we need help. I, and I'll, I'll go to, you know, she mentioned they went through the Civil War. Well, um, you know, when they came, it was the days of slavery, but they never owned any slaves. And they come with unrealistic expectations of crops to raise, but they quickly, quickly changed to cotton. But they picked all their own cotton, worked all their own fields. They eventually homesteaded more than a section of land. Actually, there's a little... They had a little bit of money, bought a little bit of land, but it turns out that where they settled wasn't the land they bought anyway. So, I know, but, so they were they were abolitionists, but uh, some served in the Confederate Army, nevertheless, and honorably served. So I, I again, I think it's a treasure, and it would be a shame if these buildings are ever allowed to just to go down. It'd even be a shame if you're never if you, if they're closed one day and you're not allowed to go in. I, I've got a question. I thought I heard Jessica say when she was reading, in the, or maybe it was, uh, right. yeah, it was Catherine. Catherine. I thought I heard you say that they purchased the land. They, they, it, they, they, they did. They, okay. they purchased land. I guess it's just, uh, but what they, I dropped my paper clip. It's been bugging me. Um, <laughs> Y'all probably seen it fly. Uh, they it read through some of the information that they actually purchased land. But what they thought was the land that they purchased wasn't the land that they purchased. 
um, but I know that the land that where it's at, um, where the original colony is at, it was a section of land. It's 640 acres is in a section, and it is measured a mile by a mile by a mile by a mile. <clears throat> um, but they were able, and that was as a group. I know years ago, people, a family could go and homestead and start out with a section, a section of land. But this was a large group of people. And I don't know, I'm just, my opinion is since there were so many of them, that was just as a group. So maybe this family, the Bob family, went and acquired them a section. And this family went and acquired them a section. So it didn't, because you've got the gambles further up the road that on some of the original property. Uh, me and Mr. Otto Krause, I'm 2.7 miles I, I drive to work. <laughs> Not very far. Tank of gas lasts me forever, thank goodness. Um, with prices the way they are, but um, I'm at the back of the colony. Dale Krause is married to my was married to my husband's mother. Uh, she lives next door to the colony, and that's where I got so much of my information from. Um, he didn't so talk there, to a lot of people, but I, I drug it out of him. So was there a record showing that purchase? And I was curious, who, was, who they purchased? Was it from the state? Or it's, from you'll have to actually go to the Claiborne Parish to get the old records. The colony dispersed in 1871. I think, what did, what did Louisiana, how many parishes did they have in that, that, at that time? They, we have 64 parishes now, right. not always. Uh, Webster Parish was formed out of Claiborne Parish in 1871, the same year the colony dispersed. <coughs> um, so, I mean, is any of those old, old records as far as land purchase, that, that would be, I, I can't answer that. I don't know. That would be something to you. Yeah, I was going to research. What does still exist as far as local records? Those are held here. But there was right. a fire in like 1850. At a tornado. That, that burned, you know, the, the courthouse at that time. But a lot of people would bring their land records, but, you know, they'd bring their deeds back in either to have them recorded or, you know, maybe for a later transaction. Um, sometimes the earlier transactions are mentioned whenever that land is sold later. So there's, there, and Aunt Ruby's there's house, Farmdale Deer to Fire, there was a lot of records there of men enlisting. Uh, there was uh, money, there were some other books, there was so much stuff uh, my father-in-law told me about that just lost. Uh, they dug around and tried to get what they could, but just all, a lot of the records were lost whenever um, Interesting. I, I always, thought, the, I always the thought they lands, just squatted the, the land. Well, no, they yeah. say some of the land tra transactions at that time are also going to be federal. Right. And I think some of those at Germantown are federal. Right. And I mean, those are. According, according to RAP, they, when they separated, when they had a big blow up, you know, the, again, they thought RAP was the <clears> man, <throat> but they had a big blow up when Count Leon was preaching. He preached through the winter church there and he's their people say that they started this other town in Phillipsburg where Rapp I know this gets confusing he had already made and sold two towns two settlements one of them he carved out of the wilderness in Indiana and there was no roads no anything on the Wabash River sold it to a man by the name of Owens and but he sold that he was back in Beaver County they had the big blow up and the Count's bunch moved down river, but in the same county. But he says they didn't manage their money well, and it was due to their debts that they had to look for another place to live, sell out and look for another place to live. George Rapp believed that God would call him to Jerusalem before the second coming. But this is a man they couldn't break away from completely. So it, I don't think it's a coincidence that they decided that they needed to leave, live on the same latitude as Jerusalem in Louisiana. George Rapp was fascinated by Louisiana. He had made a couple of trips to Louisiana, to New Orleans, and back on the Natchez Trace. He said that he would have settled in Louisiana, 
but that he knew God would be more pleased to be settled in a free state. So they came up the river, uh, and they built all their stuff at, at Grand Accord, their cabins, their fields, their planted, and they underestimated the Red River in flood stage, and it wiped them out, <coughs> and it, they got yellow fever, and lots of them died. So most things read that they were penniless at that time. But there's still this little thing about they paid some money for the land. And then you also read that the citizen of Natchitoches helped them with some monetary thing. But most of the things I've read says they eventually homesteaded most of this land right up in here. Right. Some of the family, um, and I cannot think of his name, he's in Florida. Larry, do you remember? Uh, remember his first name. He has, I forgot what it, but if you go through the red dirt roads up in Kasachi, um, he has land in there. So some families have, because I, 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 I thought that was all Kasachi. No, there's actually some private landowners in there that go back to the family because he is through, uh, related through the, all of the settlers that came here. Um, one of the men that took leadership roles is a man by the name of John Bopp. Uh, him and his wife had a daughter named Laura. Laura married a man by the name of Robert Floyd Kennan, who ended up becoming a Louisiana governor from 1952 to 1956. What history. And it all started right here in our town, you know, just right about the time Minden was being established. And uh, what great history that we have from here. And I think, you know, I'd love to try to get to do more with Germantown. I've recently, as far as uh, August, the state, I was part-time uh, Tuesday through Saturday, and I want to let everyone know and be sure to let your family know. We just reprinted a whole box full of rap cards, um, but the times has changed now. We are open Tuesday through Saturday. So I'm, I'm from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., come see me. I'm bored. Um, well, I'm not bored, but I mean, I like to stop working to go visit with people. I like to visit people. Um, but as you can see, I like to talk. It's probably one of the many reasons I don't have a voice now. I had a bunch of kids come the other day. But um, I've got some, of the, some new donated items that um, this is the doctor's book um, that my father-in-law said I could have after his passing, and I've got paperwork um, that it will go to Sidney and Lucas Krause, his grandchildren. That is the Ginchin Cottage. But I've got some lovely things here, and I sent some pictures to Shelly um, and Jennifer that they are, uh, it's two stone statues, and these things are, they look small on the picture, but they're big. That, um, and the two crystal lead vases. Um, there's also two uh, gold inlaid vases. And inside my office, I've, I've got to figure out somewhere to put it yet still, um, inside of like a huge deep shadow box that has um, a headpiece and a wedding bouquet in it. And it's lined with uh, some type of cloth and there's cloth flowers, it's just beautiful that came over here from Germany with him. Um, we've got so many books. We have a French Bible that is date of print is the year 1727. Um, just some magnificent things for everyone to come and see. I hope I see all of you out there soon. The yes. bachelor co cottage. Went down dinner during the storm. My father-in-law said it killed like three of his sheep. He said they bust through the gate it wasn't original. It came from, uh, like, I think it was Spring Hill or Sarepta moved down here, and they were trying to redo it, and it didn't make it before the storm took it, and that was whenever the parish had it. The state took over in the early 2000s. I actually moved it down, but the ironic thing was that the house exactly fit the foundation of the original bachelor. Course. Yes, the, the rocks right now, those flowers in that one picture, 
all of the foundation. And these cabins that we go in right now that are, are open for us to go in, there's rocks. There's the biggest iron ore rocks. That's what's holding these things up uh, right now. And we're walking all in there. And when people come out, and they're like, oh, my gosh. And I'm like, yeah. You know, from 1835, they're still, you know, better than the foundation. You can go probably get poured today. Uh, now they've got companies that go around and fix your foundation, and we're still rolling. You know, maybe we all need iron ore rocks. But, you know, it is... Um, it is uh, the, the only one that is, it is an original cabin is the doctor's cabin. Was moved from across that creek there to be in the donated one acre of land. But that was Dr. George Guntigan's cabin. Um, and then it was Otto Krause's, um, Dr. Krause. Um, not my neighbor Otto, but it was his great great grandfather. Um, but anyway, those, those flower beds right along the side of the doctor's cabin was all the foundation under the cabin that you're talking about, the bachelor's quarters. And what a time to live. Imagine being a young boy and you reach the age of 14 and you're out of the house. You're sent to go and live in the bachelor's quarters. You're considered grown. Um, it's the reason we hear, like, or reading through our history, through our young men in the service and such. You, you, you went, a lot of them went into the army and, and such and fought wars. And they were just no more than babies. But that's in our eyes. They are actually considered grown men. They lost their life for us. What an honor. What a great young man. Kind of along the lines of what Robert was getting at, and last thing he referenced about the homesteading. I suppose they were homesteading land to try to fill out these sections if they wanted. When do you have any, does anybody, anybody in here know what year homesteading quit that you couldn't homestead anymore? Yeah, I sure don't. Just curious. Yeah, I know it'd be nice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I got my eyes on a few places. <laughs> <laughs> History, history is something. Like the Louisiana Purchase was purchased for three cents an acre. I, I'd like to bid in on that deal too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, we're left with a boom. Well, I, if you have any more questions, I'll try to. Can you tell us what pictures we're seeing? Some of these I don't have. This is the cemetery. It's right up on the hill. Um, we have this organ. And, and doesn't work. I, if it did, it doesn't anymore. And I don't have this picture. I'm not sure what this is. This was probably a, that was a play that they did back in the 70s. Or 80s. Was that uh, Pete Colvin and his wife, uh, Evelyn? She said she filmed a little movie there, and I would love to see that. I'm not sure. This is that was Christy. And uh, Sydney Krause, that is my sister-in-law and her daughter. We got a new sign at Germantown. Uh, this is the Countess. That's as soon as you enter the exhibit. And these are some of the items. This is what you will see now, except for the Christmas tree. This is what we haven't decorated. Uh, this is a display case that was, I have it much full, a lot fuller now. Um, as you can see, the bottom's full. This is a newer picture. But it just takes time working on the books and trying to um, go through what they are. This is the crystal lead vases that were donated from the Cross Sisters. The statues. And they've been chipped and broken. You see, she's just holding. She would had, did have something in her hand. And these are broken. Mm -hmm. And the story that they told, um, it's from Rosa Cross. Um, and there's actually, I have a picture of the lady um, that was taken in Germany on the way over. But the story that the, these late sisters told me that their grandmother and grandmother had told them was that these items were, were recovered from river pirates um, on the way. This is Echinacea. A lot of the flower beds have flowers that they would have used back then for healing, and we actually, um, a lot of the medicines and things we take today are still still come from those. Um, but there's Yara, Echinacea, and a bunch of little yellow ones and blue ones that 
I forget, my mother has told me the name of them and I can't remember them. Which is probably not the actual name of them. It's probably just an old time name. This is John and Janet Sanders. They come out and volunteer and help me with tours and they dress up and what here you'll see the two little children here. He answered a question right, so he got to hold the hoe. Um, but they'll like let them wear a hat, the little girl will wear a bonnet, or else they'll get to tote a basket. It'll just and they just it just tickles them. But they do love ever their favorite part is the well. Um, but it would surprise you some of the children and y'all that was about seven years ago. <laughs> I'm tired. I've got an 18-year-old boy. <laughs> um, but anyway, this is um, back to the beginning. But um, but the children do love coming, and it it surprises me as many. Even my boss has called every school superintendent, um, all the different school boards, and told them and encouraged them. And I have spoken, called. <laughs> that the local schools don't come out more, we are free. Um, it doesn't take long to get to the museum. The children can eat, I'll throw the trash away. You know, um, all they have to do is show up, uh, you know, and get ready. So uh, if y'all have anything or can get in touch with anybody, if you can convince Mr. Rowland to start pushing these schools, y'all go for it because I've already spoke to him myself, so. I would like for him to come out and bring the children out for a tour. So, any other questions? Well, I guess I'll, I guess y'all are tired of me. <laughs> <laughs> October we had one, uh, you know, and had a few folks come out for that one. Uh, so, so coming back from the COVID shutdowns, that's that's been a struggle. And just like uh, just like Catherine saying, you know, keeping history alive hard. is extremely hard. Uh, I looked a lot better 17 years ago too when I started. <laughs> And it would be a shame that we lose parts of our history. It'd be a shame if we can't keep the doors open out of Germantown, and it'd be a, a shame if we can't keep the doors open here. Exactly. And it is a struggle every day. And those of you that have known me for many years, y'all are tired of seeing me coming with my hand out. But I don't really care because Mike Harper taught me you just keep asking till they die. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why we got Mike Harper now as our board president. <laughs> but um, you know, it, it is a struggle, and, and with Jessica coming on, uh, she's she, if you follow the Webster Journal, you see that she she posts new things every week about our history, and and she digs. She doesn't just post something because so and so posted it. She's going to make sure that it's correct when she posts it. And she digs so much that we found some stuff that we're just like, ooh. <laughs> uh, but she's, um, if you don't follow the journal, we're actually putting all of her uh, things that she's been researching now for over a year will be coming out in her uh, first book. And we're going to do it just like we did with John Egan. Everything that, that John put down on paper, John allowed me to put it in book form. And so that's why we have so much documented history, that the history that we do have, uh, you know, we, we, or we put it in book form. Um, you know, Larry Hawk uh, working on, you know, hopefully working on something with him where we can get some history uh, that he's got put in book form. But it's real important that y'all support us, um, support all the history. Uh, in, in Webster Parish. 
Still got plenty of food, so y'all eat before you leave. Still got a donation jar, y'all donate before you leave. Uh, we got, still got some wine, y'all need to drink, and then maybe then donate. <laughs> but anyway, hope to see y'all next month um, and look for some good stuff uh, to, to happen this coming year. Thank y'all.